Welcome, everyone, to episode 333 of Just Joshing. I am your host, Joshua Pantelaresco. I write stuff in podcasts, too. Today, Matthew Hughes joins the podcast. Um, I met him at uh, in December at a little, um, I would say, just a convention of artists, different artists, and uh, it was really cool to meet him. Uh, I didn't realize I'd read him before, actually, until I actually researched him a little bit more. Um, the Damn Busters is the is one of the quirkiest superhero books I've ever read. But anyway, Matthew just released an amazing book, Courtesy of Pulp Literature Press, and we talk about that and much, much more. Um, yeah, so I have to be good for one more month. This is going to be hard. Um, also, I got done probably the second nicest job interview rejection I've ever had. Um, uh, Brace Yourself Games. I've been, I've been uh, doing a lot of little, like, places where I thought it'd be neat to work with and uh, one of the places I went to look for was actually a hiring for people to come up with concepts for games and I thought that'd be super cool and it, I I was rejected for now but was encouraged to try again which tells me uh, they like my resume which is that's a nice thing and so that's that's the kind of rejection you want to hear um, yeah like I said I got a lot more I can talk and go with but I think for now we're just going to go into the conversation shall we This episode of Just Joshing is sponsored by Indie Imprint. Indie Imprint supports creators by creators. Whether you are writing a book or creating a video game, Indie Imprint works with its clients to produce, edit, and present their projects to the world. For more information, check out their website at www.indieimprint.com. I'm officially turning the uh, recorder on. I always ask this. This is a kind of a fun one. So if you got anything incriminating you'd like to say, make it good. Uh, nope. Fire away. Fire away? All right. So I actually, I, I, I was surprised because when I was looking you up, I actually had read you before and I didn't realize it. And that was the damn Busters way back in the day. I really enjoyed that book. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah. It was, it was an odd uh, experience. Yeah. Uh, do you want to know what was behind that? Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Yeah, because it, it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting take on, on on the genre, and it was like, okay, but I I, I stumbled onto you by accident. Yeah, then I hadn't read anything. I hadn't read anything in the genre. I had no idea really what urban fantasy was, except there was something about tunnels underneath London I'd heard about. Um, what it was, I uh, I had pitched a book to Lou Anders at Peer Books, he was editing it then, uh, had his own imprint, and he wanted to uh, to have me write something, write a book for him, um, but uh, his overlord said, no, his numbers aren't good enough, and that made Lou feel kind of bad. Um, so when I ran into him at World Fantasy in Saratoga, he said, let me introduce you to Mark Gascoigne, who might want to buy something off you. And so he introduced me to Mark Gascoigne, who was then uh, with an offshoot, I think, of uh, uh, that English-British publisher, um, the big one, Galantz. Anyway, nothing came of that, except that uh, in not too long after, a few months after, Mark went to uh, Angry Robot. And I pitched him on a book again, a kind of epic fantasy, some of which takes place in heaven. And he decided he didn't like that. It wasn't what they were looking for, which indeed was urban fantasy. It was what they were looking for. So at that time, I was in the middle of writing a novelette for fantasy and science fiction about a highly functioning autistic actuary who causes hell to go on strike and comes out of it as a costumed crime fighter, which is what he'd always wanted to be. So I had about 16,000 words of that written and I sent it to Mark and said, okay, well, you know, you fall off the horse, you get right back on, so how about this? And he said, no, that's interesting. And when I finished the piece, about 20,000 words, I sent it to him. And we had a discussion about what might happen afterwards once the guy was a, uh, a costumed crime fighter with a weasel-headed demon to help him um, and you know we, we back and forth with email a couple of times and then he said fine we'll take three at which point I had to come up with three novels 
based upon this 20,000 word concept, which eventually I did. But at the time, I would say I'm not an outliner. I don't plan my books. I just write them. And I had no idea what I was going to do with this afterwards. Um, I think I was midway through the second book, costume not included, before I actually figured out what I was doing with the story. <laughs> um, and of course, the titles were chosen by Angry Robot. And the I was maybe halfway through the first book, uh, The Damned Busters, when they contacted me and said, we're putting together the catalog now, and we need to know the the plots of the next two books. And I had no idea what the plots of the next two books were, because I hadn't written them yet. Uh, I discover my plots as I'm writing. Um, So I sketched out some vague ideas, and that's why if you read the Amazon blurbs uh, for these books, they really have nothing to do with the content of the books, because by the time I got around to writing them, Maybe have something different. The story had evolved in a different direction. What, what, which tends to happen when you when you when you always just pants through things is is the book goes in a zillion different directions. Exactly. I, I, I'm somewhere in the middle when I write my books. I I I let my I do plot out some things, but I give myself room to kind of go wherever the story's going to go. And sometimes my I throw my plans out the window, which is kind of why I, I think is. It, some people stay panthers is like why make a plan when it's just it's going to go its own way anyway right well I had a book out in July from Edge in Calgary it's a book called A God in Chains which I'm very happy with it's getting lots and lots of five star reviews on Amazon Um, I started writing that as I thought a novella which I would send to fantasy and science fiction or light speed and I started with a man who has complete amnesia walking along on a, on a prairie. And it's in a dying earth kind of setting. I knew that. And I had no idea who this guy was. I had no idea why he had amnesia. And I had no idea what was going to happen when he uh, met up with the caravan that he figured out he was trailing along because he could see animal dung and hoof prints and wagon wheels and so on and by the time that was done instead of being a novella it was an 80,000 word novel and two other point of view characters had come in so it was a split narration and the whole thing uh, it evolved within the framework of the dying earth stories I've been writing uh, and selling as short stories to fantasy and science fiction Uh, with two different characters. One's a wizard's henchman and the other is a thief. Uh, I tend to to write about small people who have big problems, not big people who have huge problems. Um, Anyway, at the time I started it, I had no idea. And by the time it finished, I was, uh, you know, I did one draft and then a polish and there it was, it was done. So I sent it off to Brian Hades and he bought it. Um, but that's the way I write. I have no idea what's going to come next. Ah, uh, so uh, before we get to what the win, actually, I'll go to what the win brings because that's your that's your most recent book. So, yep. where where did like like why or actually the thing I just want to read the concept about this. It's a very it's a very um, it, there's there's as you were talking to me when we met in person there, there there's definitely it's definitely based on some somewhat of a. Uh, it's, it's based on real history. So what is it about that story that fascinates you so much? Well, I'll go way back. Um, when I was a teenager, I thought I might be a historical novelist because I liked the... Uh, I'd started out when, as a 12, 13-year-old reading books for the first time. Uh, we were quite poor and we lived rural and we didn't have libraries or bookmobiles or any money to buy books so it was when I got to uh, grade nine and they bussed me into the city to Kitchener Ontario and the school had a school library that I started to read and one of the first books I'd ever read was a juvenile historical novel which was part of the grade nine curriculum in English in Ontario in those days it was a book called Q for Treason and anybody my age who went to school in Ontario knows it because they were all made to read it in grade nine. 
my elder siblings had brought home copies and I'd read it because I read anything I could get my hands on. When I got to the high school, I started reading historical novels. And I also read science fiction because my eldest brother had been a science fiction reader and used to leave things around. Um, but I was really taken with the other times and places and reading juvenile uh, historicals was, was uh, a mind-opening experience for me. Got to see all parts of the world and, and eras that I knew nothing about. Um, so by the time I was 16, I figured I was going to be a historical novelist and even started to write one when I was in my summer vacation with a, a pencil and an exercise book, which I wrote a chapter and that was it. <laughs> That's all right. But it was always sort of in the back of my mind, even though I was leaning more towards being a science fiction author by the time I got uh, into university. Um, that historical novel thing always drew me. And then one day I was reading a textbook and it was uh, about cross-cultural uh, encounters and influences. And the chapter I was reading was about how uh, people who get washed up on foreign shores, like Japanese fishermen arriving in on Vancouver Island 500 years ago, uh, they generally don't do very well. Uh, they, they, they normally clash with the local culture and are killed, often or enslaved. But there was a footnote that said, there's one exception to this, and that was a bunch of African slaves who were shipwrecked on the coast of Ecuador in the middle of the 1500s and survived and flourished along with the local indigenous people. And I thought to myself, and we're talking 1971 is when I'm reading this, I thought, nah, I'd make a great historical novel. And I made uh, fitful efforts through the university library to uh, find the background on it and get some more. I even wrote to the uh, professor somewhere in the States who had uh, been the subject of that footnote, whose research had been, never got a reply. It turned out it was very difficult to research because the true incident was only, uh, hang on a second, I'm gonna turn off my email here because it's flashing at me, there we go. Um, the only real research on this incident, on this, these events, was in Spanish language, South American academic journals and my Spanish, you know, even though I'd taken it in university and high school, it was still at the level of donde esta la pluma de mi tía, you know, where is the pen of my hand? Um, I couldn't really make head or tails out of academic journals in, in Spanish. So I didn't do anything except think about the idea from time to time and, and again take a look and see if I could develop any uh, real background on it. And that continued, we're talking decades, um, until the turn of the century when I looked again and found that academics in America had begun to write about this circumstance in uh, English. And then I started to be able to get uh, real background on what had happened and who'd been involved and you know how it all worked out. So finally, uh, we got up to about 2013, um, I applied to the Canada Council for a grant to write it, and they gave me $25,000 for this, which was a, a vote of confidence. And I, uh, I sat down, got the research going, got a professional to help me dig out stuff that I wouldn't be able to find in databases, and researched it as thoroughly as I could, and then wrote it. And unlike usually with me, um, I polished the hell out of this one. I wrote actually four drafts before it was finished. And then I worked on it with my editor at Pulp Literature Press as well. Yes. Well, I, I it's, it's so. So what it's, what it came down to, this is a story based on true events of 27 African slaves, men and women, mostly men, who were on a ship going down the coast from uh, Panama City to Lima in Peru. And this is maybe 40, 50 years after the uh, Pizarro brothers had come and conquered the Inca and things were settling down and they'd had a little civil war after that. But anyway, things were settling down in Quito and 
these slaves are being brought to work in the mines around, uh, what was it? I can't remember the name, but something like Olispo. Anyway, they were, uh, Pelosi, that's it, something like that. <laughs> anyway, they, they were wrecked on the shore. The, the ship was thrown against a reef by a squall and they came ashore and I'm pretty sure they killed uh, the crew and passengers because they were the only survivors. Um, and they melded with the local indigenous people, the people called the Nigiwa, who had been rather badly treated by the Spanish when they went through in order to uh, go up north, or go up the, the highlands rather, and conquer the, the Inca. They were depressed and demoralized and scattered into small villages where they used to live in towns of five or 6,000 on the coast and were a great trading people with balsa rafts going up and down. All of that had come to an end uh, because of the diseases and some of them had been carried off by the Spanish to uh, you know, carry burdens up into the highlands where being lowland people, uh, they got sick and died. They, you know, they would die of altitude sickness. Um, anyway, together, the Nigua and the Africans formed this composite culture uh, and got along with each other, more or less. There were some incidents and there was some fighting, but by and large, they, they formed a mixed society. And the Spanish then spent more than 20 years trying to uh, reduce them to servitude. And they outfought the Spanish. And more important, they outthought the Spanish until finally after, I think, four expeditions, the, uh, the conquistadors said, well, this is not working. Let's make a deal with them. And they did, they made a deal with the people who by then were called the Zambos. Zambo being the local term for indigenous African uh, mix. And so the Zambo state, as it was called, uh, endured for generation after generation. And in fact, if you go to that part of Ecuador now, if you go up a little bayous and creeks and so on, as a friend of mine did back in the, the 70s, what you find is Africa. Hmm. Uh, in fact, he had the experience in 1970, he was doing a forest economy survey, he was a forest economist. I used to write speeches for him after he became rich and famous. Um, but he got to one little village, way up some back creek, in a dugout canoe paddling himself. Huh. And he came ashore and walked into the, you know, the central space of the village and everybody came up to have a look at him. And one old woman came and ran her finger down his cheek and then looked to see if the white came off. <laughs> and, she had, and she had never seen a white man. And she was an old woman. That's, uh, if the place was more remote in those days, but uh, that she was a survivor, a descendant of the Zambos. And proof of their success in, uh, you know, keeping the, the conquistadors from using them back to slavery. Which anyway, I uh, I always thought this would be a wonderful novel, and by the time I got around to writing it with the research behind me, I had figured out that it would be from different points of view. I would use real people uh, who were known to have existed and, and been part of the, the scene in those days. Um, and I'd come to the conclusion that I wanted a shaman to be one of the central characters. And along the way, as I was evolving that character in the back of my head, I decided that it would be a hermaphroditic shaman, somebody way off on the edge of the bell curve, uh, because I wanted a completely different perspective hmm. on life and the universe and everything. Um, and that's what I did, and she turned out, I tend to refer to her as she, because she kind of presents as female mostly. Um, she turned out to be the average absolute linchpin of the story. She's a, uh, a genius, but of course, uneducated and, and, and you know, living in a forest somewhere, but uh, extremely sharp. And she's the person who moves the plot. She's like a, a mini Machiavelli. But yeah. I, I was quite fascinated and pleased with her as a character as she came out of the back of my head and, and took shape. So uh, that book came out in December. 
It's called What the Wind Brings. Uh, the publisher is Pulp Literature Press from uh, the Lower Mainland, Vancouver. And it's doing fairly well. It's got uh, good numbers on Amazon and good five-star reviews. And people, knowledgeable people who've read it, uh, Cecilia Holland, one of my uh, favorite historical novelists that I've been reading for 50 years, and everybody should read her. Uh, she called it a triumph, which was very nice. Uh, David Gerald, the other day, the you know the triples man, yes, uh, quite a well accomplished science fiction writer. He said it was marvelous, which I, I took as a great compliment. Um, and if you know Robert Runte, he is. Uh, well-known editor and critic yes. of Canadian science fiction and fantasy. Me and Rob do, do know each other, yes, we do. So, Well, he, he wrote a lengthy review on Goodreads and said it was effing brilliant, so that's nice. Effing <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> 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 language. Effing brilliant is awesome. And don't worry about it, you can swear on my podcast, it's all good. So, But uh, it sounds to me like this was kind of like your magnum opus. That's what I called it. It is my great work. It's the one I would like to be remembered for. Yeah. I mean, everything else that I've written, I, I've done my best, but I've, I know I've been writing adventure stories and comedic stories and basically entertainments. But this one, I mean, it was 40 years cooking in my head before I actually sat down to research and write it properly. And it's very much... Uh, it's an outgrowth of my life. Um, I spent a lot of my time in politics. I was a speechwriter for uh, cabinet ministers and leaders of, of governments, uh, at least in BC. And uh, also hung out a lot with CEOs of major corporations, because those are the people I wrote for. Which was peculiar, because I actually come from the working poor. I, I am, you know, not quite trailer trash, but pretty close to it um, lived on a, as uh, you know a poor man's son growing up I've been on welfare I, I've uh, worked at minimum wage jobs that most people wouldn't want to touch but you know when you're like that you take the job you can get and you do mm -hmm. enough to keep yourself alive um, but I found myself as an outsider in a much different uh, environment as an adult because I was hanging out with rich people and powerful people and not just uh, you know working from the, the outer fringes I was often a confidant uh, in the executive suite and in the uh, the smoke filled rooms where decisions are made and real power is used so I've seen powerful people close up doing what powerful people do and I used some of that uh, that knowledge and experience to make this what the wind brings a basically a novel of political intrigue in a little village in a jungle in the coast of Ecuador in the 1500s as well as up in the kingdom of Quito where the the merchants and the church and the powerful people the viceroy and so on were exercising their own political powers on each other so, so I have to warn people if you think this is going to be a bodice ripper historical novel with lots of uh, sword play and daring do there's a certain amount of that in it because there is violence and it was a violent time but basically it's uh, a story about the powerful and the powerless uh, intriguing and working with and against each other so it's got a lot of real life to it hmm. sounds to me like you finally did what you wanted to do in high school you became a historical novelist yes it did actually yeah yeah uh, I'm thinking this is since I've done this uh, book and it's come out and it's getting a good response um I've gone back to that idea I had when I was 16 and I'm thinking I might actually revive that and write it one of these days if I live long enough. I can't wait another 40 years. Um, but it was uh, an interesting little tale about just near the, 
the death of Alexander the Great when he came back from conquering the world and established his uh, his capital in Babylon. Um, he is said to have told uh, sent a crew of people on a ship to circumnavigate Africa because they wanted to know how far down Africa went, uh, you know, down the Red Sea and so on. Um, and then he died. He died of malaria not long after that. Nobody knows whether the ship actually went, and they certainly don't know if it ever came back. And I thought, you know, put a group of uh, different people from, and in those days, Alexander, he'd conquered everything. So you would have everything from Greeks and Macedonians to Phoenicians to Egyptians, uh, Babylonians, Persians. They could all be mixed together in a crew. And... Uh, go sailing off into who knows where. That's an interesting premise for a book. Several books, actually, if you do yeah, that right. right. If you do that right. Um, and why not? I mean, heck, I mean, you, you prove to yourself, I think, that you can do a historical novel. Now, obviously, you don't have 40 years, but if you're like me or like any other author, you never forget your ideas, ever. They're always in the back of your mind. So you might be... You might have been cooking this up for a while, anyway. I gotta argue with you on that because it did actually happen to me mm. back in the uh, the eighties. I had an agent in Vancouver, and then I was writing screenplays and treatments, and she was trying to see if she could uh, sell them down in L.A., which wasn't working. But I uh, I ran into her once at. Uh, one of those drinks things that people do in that business, you know, wine and cheese and cocktails and so on. And I hadn't seen her for a few months. And the first thing she said to me is, did you ever do anything with that idea you had? And I said, what idea? And it was something I told her about maybe a year before. Um, a completely, uh, well, a reasonably well fleshed out idea for a... Uh, uh, an afterlife romantic comedy fantasy um, in which people when they die if they're good or if they're bad they get assigned to be either devils or angels on people's shoulders on living people's shoulders just like in the cartoons um, and I'd come up with that idea I told her about it and then I'd completely forgotten it but after she reminded me uh, I actually wrote to uh, a, a treatment for a screenplay, you know, a 30 page outline of the story, I guess you would call it. Um, and it never sold. But uh, 20 years later, I found it on the, uh, the back reaches of my hard drive and thought, I could write this up and sell it to Fantasy and Science Fiction magazine, which I did. <laughs> Well, you see, that, that's my point. Actually, I think you made my point. Oh, you kind of did forget the idea, it came back to you. And, yeah. it, and and you used it and you used it in some other way. Like I, I have ideas I still remember from high school, right when I was starting writing. And I found that for me, right, okay, they don't necessarily go the way you anticipate them going, right? Um, they, they like sometimes the idea you had in your head uh, doesn't work the way you had. Like one of my ideas when I was younger was a virus that made people live forever, right? I thought that'd be an interesting idea. Right, it's it, and it is an interesting idea. But when I tried to write the novel, I, I it, this was this, this was my my first real serious novel. I broke it. Right, I, I I I made mistakes. I learned an awful lot doing it. But I can't write that story anymore the way I had originally intended, simply because my voice has changed from when I started. But those ideas are still there, and I have used them here and there, and other things I've done. I find those ideas never really fully truly go away just come back in unexpected ways. Yeah, well, yeah, it's true. And it's especially useful if you write them down and put them on a hard drive somewhere. Yes. So you can rediscover them. Because once, yeah, once I rediscovered that idea, it, it went, you know, flash into my brain, here's the story. And away I went. And I yeah. wrote it up at about 15,000 words and only took a couple of weeks because there it was. I mean, it was all worked out in the back of my head. I'd just forgotten that it was there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, I think we all all of us have those ideas from time to time in, in there. So I mean, in one sense, I mean that sixteen year old idea, it's probably been percolating for a long time, 
And I'm very curious to see what you come up with when you do it. Well, yeah, because I have come to understand, well, many years ago now, um, there's a guy in the back of my head who seems to put these things together and then feeds them to me at a thousand, two thousand words a day. And I write them up and then polish them a bit, but he seems to know the story completely and feeds it to me a bit at a time because it, it, it's like that, you know, the, the Michelangelo thing. I don't think he ever really said it. You know, you start with a block of marble and you want to create a statue of David, so you just chip away everything that isn't David. And there it is. You know, like it's already there in your head. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's one of those situations where I think, actually all writers can keep in mind, sometimes sometimes these ideas are part of bigger ideas, and sometimes, sometimes... But I will say this a credit to you. It's really hard to keep an idea. I, uh, I'm sure it's evolved quite a bit since when it started. But you told a story from when you from from your younger days. You were able to keep it up. I mean, it took forty years, but you did it, and that's a huge accomplishment, man. Congrats. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, it's. I'm glad that it worked out that way. I, I'm very, very glad that the Canada Council gave me the money. Otherwise, it would probably just have remained something stuck in the back of my head because finding a publisher for a 150,000 word historical novel even with some slipstream magical realism thrown in even if you publish 20 odd novels already it's not easy that's not these days that's not an easy sell no and I was very uh, glad that I'd established a relationship with the women who run uh, pulp literature press by selling stories to them for their quarterly magazine which is what they did for five or six years before they got into book publishing. Um, I trusted them and they trusted me. And when I showed them this book, uh, it didn't scare them. No. They say, oh, God, it's 150,000 words. How are we going to do that? Um, they said, we love this book. And I'll figure it out. Yeah. I know, I know Jen. Jen, Jen, um, it, it, it's uh, it, if, if they like something they go for it so I really respect about pulp and they're not afraid to try different things out so I think he found a really good home with the right people well I'm hoping this book is going to lift them because um, I'm not really assuming it's going to be a bestseller but I think it is and this sounds slightly egotistical but I think it is award worthy it's that kind of book that uh, <laughs> juries might take a look at and say, hey, that's not bad. Well, um, I hope you have a little ego about it, because, I mean, you worked your ass off on it. I mean, in not, like, honestly, it sounds to me like this, again, this is your magnum opus. You should have an ego about it a little bit. You, I mean, no matter what happens with it, I mean, this is the one you want to hang your hat on? I feel pretty good. I would think it'd be, if I wrote something like that, I'd want it to be, able to, I would think probably the same way. I think, yeah. that's, a, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think you can be uh, a fictioneer um, unless you've got a certain amount of ego. You have to say to yourself, "Well, I'm going to put stuff down, and people are going to want to read it because I'm smart enough and I'm good enough." And gosh darn it, people like me. <laughs> like that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I mean. So yeah, I, I, I'm glad you do. I, I'm glad you're proud of it. I really am. It sounds. It sounds like. Um, it sounds like you put your heart and soul into it. So I'm gonna, so you, I'm going to ask this, but then I think we, we might even be able to call this a wonderful interview here. Um, so you, you finally became a historical writer, and you already have a kind of another story you want to go. Do you want to do more history novels? Do you want to do more science fiction novels? Like, what do you want to do going forward? Well, this is strange in a way, because I really set out in the 90s to be a crime writer. Uh, I had a novel from Doubleday Canada. I was selling stories to Alfred Hitchcock magazine and other venues and a a much lamented lost online magazine called Blue Murder, which was wonderful, and tried to grow too fast into a a book publisher and crashed and died because of the the dot-com bubble. The, The guy who was backing Blue Murder lost all his money and the whole thing died 
Um, but I was on my way to being a crime writer. I had uh, publication credits. I'd won the uh, Arthur Ellis Award from the Crime Writers of Canada. And then because of the, well, flukes that I can't be bothered to tell the whole long story of, um, a fantasy novel I'd written and got published briefly in 1994, I resold to uh, Time Warner Books, Warner Aspect, and they asked for a sequel, and I wrote the sequel. And suddenly I was a fantasy author, uh, and with a, a peculiar slant of being obviously highly influenced by Jack Vance. And that led to other uh, editors and publishers saying to me, like Nightshade Books and David Hartwell at Tour, if, if you write, we'll publish it. Um, and they were offering me contracts and checks and suddenly I was a fantasy and science fiction author, even though I'd meant to be a crime writer. Um, I'm a natural crime writer because I come from a, a family which is well larded with uh, minor criminals. But anyway, um, I find myself writing science fiction and fantasy because people will publish it. And I'm now at the point where I've written more than a dozen novels and sold them and some, I guess, maybe 80 stories for uh, fantasy and science fiction magazine. And shortlisted for the Nebula and the Aurora and the Philip K. Dick and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'd really like to just be a, a crime writer, though, but uh, I have to make this compromise that I write about criminals and ne'er do wells in science fiction and fantasy settings, and that seems to satisfy everybody. I do want to plug one thing, though. Um, Go ahead. Uh, now that I remembered it again. Um, I announced this uh, a week or so ago. Uh, I've made a deal with the son of Jack Vance, John Vance, uh, to write a sequel to one of Jack Vance's most famous works, which, which is the five novel Demon Princes series. Ooh. And I've, uh, I've signed a contract on that and I've got the first couple of thousand words written and that's what I'm gonna be doing through this spring. Uh, that almost feels one. like another childhood dream come true. Am I right yes, on that? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, Jack Vance is one of the first uh, science fiction authors I ever read. And I'm going back to, I guess, 1962 or three. My the, uh, eldest brother had a uh, subscription to Galaxy Magazine, which was a big magazine in those days. And he left it lying around, and I picked it up and read it. And I read The Dragon Masters, which was an award-winning uh, novella by Jack Vance. And that was just, that blew me away. That was just it. And after that, any time I came across a Jack Vance story, a novel, I read it. And that went all the way through uh, my life. I, anytime I came across Jack Vance, I read Jack Vance. And I looked for Jack Vance, and I sought out old stuff, and, and you know, and he uh, he sank into my mind, uh, absolutely uh, pervasively. And, and when I came to write my own stuff, I was definitely writing in a, a Jack Vance mode, not trying to copy, but no, being being influenced, strongly influenced. We all have our influences, man. We all we all have people that we really, really, really like. We go. I'm not saying I want to write exactly like but that tone and that experience we felt reading. We kind of want to convey that in our writing. And for you, that's Jack Vance. For me, that's that's Asnoff, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Ray Bradbury. But I mean, if we all have those. Um, we all have those people like that we admire. Um, I interviewed Spider Robinson about a year ago. And uh, he, he talked about he talked about the fact that he finished a Heinlein novel, and for him that was like a big thing. So, for you, man, I'm happy for you, man. That sounds like a dream come true, and I I I, I hope when it's done, um, you, you like you let the world know, and I'll definitely be reading it. I like Jack Vance too. So, well, it's a mix of intimidating and 
joy making at yeah. the same time. It's, it's a peculiar experience. Flattering? Sorry? Is it also a little flattering? Oh, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's a big thing. Um, it's more... Uh, I'm stretching and testing myself to see if I can really do this. But but I've, got, I've got a character and I've got a situation and I know there's peril in the background and I don't know what that peril is yet, but I'm moving my character towards it. I've decided to be different, deliberately different from Vance in that my character, my protagonist, is going to be female. And he didn't do much in the way of uh, female protagonists, if any. Uh, he's tended to have male heroes. But I'm going with a woman. Um, it'll give a different tone. Yep. I think. And, and, and I'll put your, a little bit of your own stamp into it, too, which is, I think, the way it should be. That sounds awesome, man. Congratulations and good luck. I hope it, I hope you knock it out of the park. Well, thank you. I, I'm going to give it my best shot. And, that, and that's all we can do at the end of the day. Mr. Mr. Hughes, I think we have a good interview here. What do you think? I'm happy with it. You yeah, know, I like the blather on. Yeah. Well, then there's, no, there's nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong with that. What two two final things? Thank you for the Tom Holt book. When I met you in person, you gave me it. And I, I'm, it's on my to be read list, and I appreciate that very much. Oh yeah. Okay. And number one, number two. All right, since we're at the end of the interview, I tend we're talking about what the wind brings. We, we've talked about that a little bit again, like that. So maybe you want to talk about that again in, in detail for us to close things off. But also, where can people find you? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I have a web page. It's Matthew Hughes, two T's in Matthew, MatthewHughes.org. You can find me. You can find me on Wikipedia, too. Um I'm on Facebook. I have a, a Matthew Hughes author page and also my own personal page and the contents of each are identical to the other. I, I only use Facebook pretty much for uh, making announcements of things I'm doing or have done. And I have a Twitter account. The, uh, the Twitter handle is Hapthorn, H-A-P-T-H-O-R-N. Um, what I would like people to uh, to do is if they go by my webpage matthewhughes.org there's a little thing in the corner you can fill in your name and email and get onto the mailing list for my monthly uh, monthly newsletter uh, that I've been sending out now for three years which is all about what I'm writing and selling and reviews and I give a free read every month of something from my backlist and I also am writing a kind of autobiography in progress and about my strange and peculiar life. Um, so usually an episode of that appears every month as well. Very cool. And when Did I miss anything? Oh yeah, I have, a, I have a Patreon account if anybody wants to give me three bucks a month to keep me writing, which I greatly appreciate. Sure. What's your Patreon? Uh, it, it's just... Is it, is it? Um, if you go to Patreon and put my name in, Matthew Hughes, it sends me to the it sends you to the uh, the account. Fair enough. All right. And that was my conversation with Matt Hughes. What the wind brings, courtesy of Pulp Literature Press, is available now. It's a good book. Matt's a great writer, and it was cool. It's cool to let him talk on podcast. So Matt, thanks for coming on my show. You are welcome back anytime you like. Um, let's see here. So I'm not going to be talking about me too much. I feel good. Uh, I, I got to go sparkle the muffin here very shortly. So before I do that, um, I thought I'd uh, talk about some of my friends. Ed, Will- Ed Willett is doing a really cool uh, anthology uh, called Shapers of Worlds. It's based on the uh, his podcast, which is World Shapers, which is a great podcast for science fiction and fantasy fans. It talks about world building. It talks about the authors and their works. Ed's a great pod, does a great podcast, um, and he deserves his reward award for what he's done with it. It's an awesome, awesome show. Um, some of the people in it: uh, Dave Weber, Ellie Moss Jr., Ed himself. Um, there's a it's it's a who's who of science fiction and fantasy. He's about to do a Kickstarter for it starting February 28th. So go to Kickstarter.com/slash/products at Edward Willett/slash/Shapers of Worlds. 
it's an awesome thing. I'm going to talk about another buddy of mine, too. Um, he's a colorist in the comic book industry, Anthony D. Lee. Um, Anthony, uh, unfortunately, um, a comic book creator I admire has been added to doing some very, very, very uh, questionable things with quite a few women, and not necessarily in the industry, but around it, and, and just using his fame to... Min- just do some things that isn't uh, cool. And uh, Anthony, in protest, and to his credit, actually walked away from working for this individual. Um, he's an amazing colorist. He does some great, great work. He's a cool dude. Anthony is, a, is an amazing guy. Um, I hope to get him on the podcast at some point. Um, my nickname for him is Good Sir, because he really is a good sir. He's, really, he's one of the better dudes out there. So if you need someone to care for coloring, if you're a comic book creator, definitely look him up. Anthony D. Lee is on Facebook. Just look him up like that. That'd be a good way to contact him for work. All right, that'll do for this episode of Just Joshing. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so a bunch of different ways. You can subscribe to the podcast. I'm on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, most other players as well, uh, Podomatic as well. So it says click the subscribe button. Let people know this podcast exists. I appreciate that very much. Um... My books, The Watcher, Storm, Master, and Wandering God, are available to Mirror World Publishing. I have merchandise, jpentelleresco.redbubble.com. You want to buy a unicorn t-shirt, you want to support the podcast by buying some merchandise, you can do that. So there, support my sponsor, Indie Imprint. Indie Imprint's your one-stop shop where you can get you, if you are a writer, gamer, uh, they will help you get your work out there. They are amazing people, so definitely check them out. My Twitter and Instagram is at jpentelaresco. Uh, my Facebook page is Joshua Pentelaresco, author, podcaster. Stay inspired, everybody, and thanks for listening. Josh. Josh.